Maybe you remember her poster on Andy's wall in Shawshank Redemption, or maybe you've seen some of her old movies. Either way, Rita Hayworth remains a household name to this day. Unfortunately, like many old Hollywood stars, Rita has her fair share of skeletons in the closet. From a disturbing childhood to a turbulent love life to becoming a literal princess, we're going to talk about it all to see what we can learn about this Hollywood icon. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Prism of the Past. Today, we're going to be talking about Rita Hayworth. Like other Hollywood stars we've featured previously, there will be some incredibly dark moments in today's episode. There will be mentions of incest, suicide, and both sexual and physical abuse. So if that's not something you're in the mood for today, feel free to click away. With that being said, let's get into it. Rita Hayworth was born Margarita Carmen Cancino on October 17, 1918 in Brooklyn, New York. Her father was a Spanish-born dancer, Eduardo Cancino and Volga Hayworth. One of his father's dancing partners, her aunt Elisa, was Rita's mentor at a young age, and she looked up to her before eventually replacing her aunt as his dance partner. Some of my sources don't really speak much to her childhood. It's just said that Rita, then named Margarita, eventually joined her father on the stage in nightclubs in the US and Mexico before a Fox film company producer spotted her when she was 16. Dancing was in her blood, so in the mid thirties, she began appearing in movies. Other sources, however, paint a dark picture of Rita's childhood. She had two younger brothers who played with other neighborhood kids, but she was never allowed to join in because she was practicing or waiting until it was time to perform. Sometimes she'd have to catch fish for dinner because Eduardo drank and gambled their money away. She was a self-described Spanish peasant. Although this wasn't known for quite some time, Rita revealed to one of her husbands that she was sexually and physically abused by her father. Barbara Leeming, author of A Biography of Rita Hayworth, says that she learned of these details during her research and says that the abuse likely began when Rita was 12, as she'd been taken out of school to dance on the road with her father. Rita explains that they did four shows a day, two in the afternoon and two in the evening. She was allowed very little freedom and became lonely and withdrawn. They had me dancing almost as soon as I could walk, she said. But this was far from the worst of it. Rita and her father slept in the same bed. And as one article put it, Eduardo raped her in the afternoons, then danced with her at night. As for the physical abuse, Eduardo would beat Rita if she made mistakes on stage or failed to catch fish. To avoid child labor laws, he had her dance on gambling boats off the coast of California in sleazy casinos and in nightclubs in Mexico. Her mother, Volga, tried to protect Rita, but it wasn't enough. Rita would be made to wear skimpy clothes and lipstick and her father would introduce her as his wife. It wasn't long until Rita did have a husband though. Shortly after she was discovered by Fox producer Agua Calienta, she began being cast in movies like Under the Pampas Moon, Dante's Inferno, Charlie Chan in Egypt, Meet Nero Wolf, and Human Cargo. Only a couple years later in 1937, Edward Charles Judson convinced Rita to marry him. Rita was only 18 years old, and by all accounts, Judson had been both her manager and manipulator. Not only did he pretend to be a Texas oilman when he was a car salesman, but he convinced Rita to take on the name Rita Hayworth and dye her hair auburn. Rita's mother is said to have opposed the marriage, which strained their family ties. Not to mention, Rita desperately wanted to trust her husband and not rely on her father anymore. But Judson gradually showed his true colors, controlling her money and insisting that Rita take part in numerous publicity stunts to get her a movie contract. She did eventually gain one with Columbia, but at that point, Judson was becoming downright cruel to her. When speaking about him in later years, she said, "'Basically, I am a good gentle person, but I am attracted to mean personalities.'" Judson, who was 22 years her senior and thrice divorced, referred to Rita as his investment and made her raise her hairline by painful electrolysis. One article claims, "'If she resisted his demands, he hit her. He even offered her to the head of Columbia Pictures, Harry Cohn, as a mistress. Even though Rita's Latino roots were well known during her years as a celebrity, this makeover eliminated many traces of her ethnicity. Some researchers and historians argue that transformation was simply part of Rita's brand and that she could be an incredibly different person on screen, becoming a sensual, confident woman when in actuality, she was rather shy and sensitive. One article explains, 
There wasn't a moment of Hayworth's fame when people didn't know that she used to look like somebody else with a different name, a different hair color and ethnicity. Redhead Rita was dubbed the California Carmen in the press. And it's no surprise that many of her films from You Were Never Lonelier to Affair in Trinidad and Gilda had far flung settings that reminded audiences of her exotic former identity. Leeming's book, on the other hand, attributes this to the abuse Rita suffered. She was used to acting under orders from a young age and her performances were impeccable, but that's all they were, performances. This article goes as far to analyze said performances, such as the movie Gilda and Pal Joey, where Rita performs mock strip teases. During both of them, she's artfully indecent or completely enveloped in the character. Whether or not Rita's transformation was a part of her brand or these physical changes came from her husband or Hollywood itself, many sources argue it's despicable what Rita had to go through. She was idolized both as a white body and as an ethnic one, Aaron Blakemore writes. She played both sexy and wholesome roles, taking one, the permissiveness Hollywood felt her ethnicity allowed while simultaneously protecting her identity as a chaste white woman. Personally, I feel that if Rita wanted to dye her hair red or change her name, that's of course her decision to make. But the idea that her husband slash manager forced her to in order to make her more acceptable to Hollywood at that time, of course, that's going to leave a bad taste in my mouth as it should yours. Ultimately, Judson's plan worked. Columbia studio head Harry Cohn and Rita's husband Judson altered her appearance on her rise to fame. At first, Cohn loaned her out to other studios to capitalize on his investment in Rita. And once she returned to Columbia, she was much bigger star than when she'd left. Columbia was even referred to as the Rita Hayworth studio at one point in time because she was such a major name there. She was known for playing famous femme fatale roles in melodramas such as The Lady in Question, Blood and Sand, and The Strawberry Blonde. She also danced opposite Fred Astaire, who later referred to Rita as his favorite dance partner. Yet despite all the superficial things, changing her hair color and hairline, Columbia never taught Rita Hayworth to sing, a fact she's said to have resented them for. Every time you witness Rita singing in a movie, it's been dubbed. Thankfully, after earning a name for herself, Rita finally felt comfortable enough to leave Judson. He apparently threatened to throw acid in her face when she said she was leaving, but after granting him a chunk of California real estate and 12,000 in cash, he left her alone. And in February, 1942, the divorce was settled. One documentary claims that Cohn even paid Judson $30,000 to leave Rita alone forever and to keep his mouth shut. Apparently when filming My Gal Sal, Rita fell for co-star Victor Mature and Cohn knew that if this information became public, it would damage the studios and Rita's rising fame. She and Victor were engaged, but never married. Instead, she fell for Orson Welles, who we'll get into in just a minute. Unfortunately though, this was not the end of the abuse. Cohn, furious that Rita rejected him, treated her terribly as well. Rita's friend, Bob Schiffer, described Cohn's actions on the 1948 set of The Lives of Carmen to author Leeming. All Harry Cohn wanted to do was get even because he'd never had any sexual encounter of any kind with Rita, which annoyed the hell out of him. A maid outside Rita's dressing room reported on exactly who went in and out, and a bug inside even picked up Rita's private conversations. Rita had known about the bug for some time, but she also knew if she tore it out, another would soon take its place. Accordingly, she whispered intimate details that she would not want Cohn to know. But one thing Rita made no attempt to conceal from Harry Cohn was her contempt for him and his toadies. She hated them all. She didn't pull many punches with Cohn as to what she thought of him. Despite the ridiculous behavior she had to deal with from Cohn, Rita wasn't afraid to stand up for herself. On her rise to the top in the 40s, Rita had a love affair with eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes. Rumor and legend has it that this relationship lives on as the land of Hughes Ranch home is also referred to as Rita's ranch. However, in 1942, they fizzled just as her relationship with Victor did and she found a man that she called the great love of my life, Orson Welles. It's been said that to draw Rita out of her shell, Wells would pretend to read her mind just so she'd have to talk to him to correct him. He pursued her relentlessly, writing letters to her and even claiming that he knew he wanted to marry her the moment he saw her pinup. Vanity Fair says that not only did Rita enjoy spending time with Wells and his friends at the theater, but one of the reasons they may have connected so well is because they were about the same age. When they married, everything seemed right by the world. And they soon had a child named Rebecca in 1944. Rita soon became a favorite pinup of American servicemen during World War II and during the 1946 film Gilda, Rita cemented her place as a Hollywood star. The movie even earned her the nickname, The Love Goddess. On the other hand, later in life, Rita seemed to have mixed feelings about the whole thing. She once said, let's face it, being a sex symbol or whatever they call it, that was great to me. Okay, so I made some bad pictures. Well, who doesn't have zingers and zongers? 
Even Orson, he's had his zongers. That's why the most important thing you have in this business is a sense of humor. Then on a more negative note, she remarked, men go to bed with Gilda, but wake up with me. Sure, she had money and fame, but people already assumed that they knew Rita without actually getting to know her at all. People who worked with her at the time said that Rita was quiet, professional, and also a little sad. It was around this time that Rita's mother passed away, devastating Rita. She seemed to value family more after this happened, reuniting with her brothers and wanting to spend time at home with Orson and Rebecca. Yet it was something he wasn't able or perhaps willing to give her. Only a month after Gilda came out, a photo of Rita was glued to the first atom bomb to be tested in peacetime. Orson said, Rita almost went insane. She was so angry. Orson was able to convince her that this wasn't a publicity stunt by Cone, but a homage to her from the flight crew. Though Rita was emphatic that she didn't want to be Gilda all her life, there was even more frustrations in her personal life as the cracks in her happy marriage began to show. According to Orson, the atom bomb incident was the first time Rita flew into an angry rage. She would never get angry at him, but at Cohn, her father, her mother, or her brother. She would break all the furniture and she'd get in a car and I'd have to get in a car and try to control her. She'd drive up the hills suicidally. Terrible, terrible nights, he said. The dependency between Rita and her husband wasn't healthy. As one source puts it, the marriage traded financial dependence on his part with emotional dependency on hers. To make matters worse, Orson began seeing other actresses like Judy Garland on the side. Rita wanted to leave him. They separated once she discovered the cheating, but Orson and Rita still depended on one another financially. Not only had Orson made bad business decisions, but he'd been blacklisted from Hollywood too. And this was in part due to the Red Scare, a topic we've touched on previously. Anything that was left-wing would be deemed communist in those days. And Orson found himself straying too far into what was considered communist territory. The FBI opened up a file on Wells in April, 1941, just before Citizen Kane's release and kept it active until 1956, even going so far as to call the movie nothing more than an extension of the Communist Party. So in an attempt to make some money and get Orson Welles on Hollywood's good side again, he and Rita made a new movie, The Lady from Shanghai. Rita's signature hair was dyed blonde and some say that the film seemed to be about hate as opposed to love. All in all, the movie didn't live up to its ambition and it's been called puzzling but thrilling to this day. The couple divorced in 1947 after the film was released with Rita citing his prolonged absences and obsessive dedication to his work as the reason. Mr. Wells showed no interest in establishing a home. Mr. Wells told me he should never have married me in the first place as it interfered with his freedom in his way of life, she said. After all this stress, Rita needed a vacation. She attended a charity ball at the Eiffel Tower and gave a speech in French on behalf of poor children. One member in the audience was enthralled, Prince Ali Khan. According to my source, Prince Ali Khan, whom Leeming describes as a Casanova, cyberite, gentleman jockey, auto racer, hunter, pilot, horse breeder, soldier, and Muslim religious leader, was the son of Aga Khan, the imam of millions of Asian and African Ismaili Muslims. Though he was married, Khan soon convinced famous hostess Elsa Maxwell to introduce him to Hayworth. He pursued the reluctant star across the French Riviera, filling her suites with flowers and buzzing her hotels in his private plane. According to Leeming, he even allegedly sent a fortune teller to the superstitious Hayworth to tell her to be with him. And this was a massive scandal. Khan's father was the spiritual leader of almost 9 million. Rita was one of the highest paid actresses earning almost $400,000 a year and she was with a married man. The General Federation of Women's Clubs boycotted her films. The pop himself condemned the relationship as illicit, but this whirlwind romance didn't stop there. Columbia was so upset that Rita breached contract to travel to see Khan that they suspended her, inspiring the Hollywood Reporter headline, from Khan to Khans to Khan to Canned. Though Rita later revealed she'd been in deep slavery with Columbia, mentioning how they bugged her dressing room. At the same time, Rita said she didn't believe the role she was meant to play at the time, Lana Hansen, is best suited to her talents. Without Hollywood in the way, Ali proposed to Rita and promised he'd divorce his wife immediately. Though the prince had been smitten with Rita since he laid eyes on her, Rita's secretary and traveling companion, Shifra Haran, said that Rita didn't quite have feelings as strong as his. Orson Welles claimed that at one point before Ali and Rita were married, she was so nervous that she asked Welles to take her back. According to Vanity Fair, against his better judgment, he had to advise her to go through with it. No law could stop her from divorcing Ali if it didn't work out. She was marrying the most promiscuous man in Europe, Welles said, just the worst marriage that could ever have happened. And she knew it. It was a fatal marriage, the worst thing that could have happened to her. He was charming, attractive, a nice man, but the wrong husband for her. 
Sure enough, shortly after having a daughter, Yasmin in 1949, things began to fall apart for Rita and Ali too. They fought frequently, he was often absent, and just as Ali had done with his previous wife, he began to cheat. Rita couldn't tolerate this, nor the duties of a princess. Etiquette, royal protocol, and exhausting society events, it wasn't the life Rita wanted. She lashed out, even throwing drinks, picture frames, and books in Ali's face. As one documentary about her life explains, Rita had just wanted privacy at that point. She wanted to be a wife and a mother. That simply wasn't a life Ali could give her. And while they were able to remain friends, their marriage crumbled. Rita returned to movies in the 1950s. She threw herself into new roles, having two girls to support and had a fantastic comeback. This Hollywood star shining as bright as ever. The people around Rita adored her as well. One actress, Juanita Moore, a co-star and friend of hers states, "'I remember so well when I first met her, "'I was scared to death, frightened to death. "'But when they introduced me to her, "'she put her arms around me and said, "'We're gonna have a good time. "'She was the only one that allowed me to get close to her, "'to really talk to her.'" Rita had friends, yes, but she was desperate to find love again. She attempted to reconcile with Ali in 1952, but this failed again, and they were officially divorced in 1953. Now, before we continue on to talk about some of the hard times that Rita would face in her adult life, let's take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. How do you choose which internet service provider you use? The sad thing is most of us have very little choice because ISPs operate like monopolies in the regions they serve. So to prevent ISPs from seeing my internet activity, I protect all my devices with ExpressVPN. So what exactly is it? Well, ExpressVPN is a simple app for your computer or smartphone that encrypts all your network data and tunnels it through a secure VPN server. And that's so that your ISP cannot see any of your activity. Just think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, the list of people you've messaged, sites you've visited, and videos you've watched get tracked by tech giants who sell your information for profit, all at the expense of you. I love that ExpressVPN is available on my computer. It just runs in the background, it does its thing. I like when a software or a program can just do its own thing and it doesn't need my help. And that's the same thing with the app on my phones. And it is the best thing I've ever done for myself. So stop handing over your personal data to ISPs and other tech giants who mine your activity and sell off your information. Protect yourself with the VPN I trust to keep me private online. Visit expressvpn.com slash prism. That's expressvpn.com slash prism to get an extra three months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash prism right now to learn more. This episode is also sponsored by Felix Gray Glasses. The blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized to set out to create an eyewear that would improve daily screen time. And since then, Felix Gray has been on a mission to create a better relationship with our eyes and technology. Felix Gray lenses filter 15% more of the most important blue light. So whether you're heading back to the office, back to school, or back to whatever, you can count on Felix Gray. And Felix Gray has more than just blue light lenses. If you need prescription, non-prescription, whatever you need, they have tons of frames. They have different sizes, so you can adjust how wide they are, how high the arch is over your nose. It's kind of nice. I have the pair of Volta in black, and I really love them. They're so comfortable, I forget they're there. And again, non-prescription and prescription are available too. So check them out now at felixgrayglasses.com slash prism. That's Felix Gray Glasses com slash prism. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. Felixrayglasses.com slash prism. Big band singer Dick Hames was literally known as Mr. Evil around Hollywood. Some sources claim that he and Rita were married so quickly in 1953 because Hames was about to be deported to Argentina. Aside from taking care of his citizenship, Rita also paid for all of Hames' debts. He had so many that he couldn't even step into the state of California without getting arrested. Whether it was the immigration department or the IRS, the bad publicity wore on Rita. The worst of it came when the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children actually stepped in. And according to one source, Hayworth was investigated for child neglect in April, 1954, when she left nine-year-old Rebecca and her younger half-sister Yasmin Aga Khan with a babysitter in New York while she traveled to Florida with her fourth husband, singer Dick Hames. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children stepped in after neighbors complained that the oldest girl was not in school and both were playing in trash. Rebecca had attended boarding schools and summer camps in France, Switzerland, and California. It wasn't because mother was filming in so many places, it was because she was married so often, she said. Nothing ever came of these charges, though it seems like her former husband, Ali, helped her fight them. 
whilst Rebecca and Yasmin were returned to her from protective court custody. The documentary about Rita I found also describes this event and they kind of recall it a little differently saying the entire event was actually Hames's fault. It claims that Rebecca and Yasmin were staying with Hames's mother and unbeknownst to Rita, the children were left alone. Rita's marriage with Hames came to a head not long afterwards when Hames struck Rita in the face at Coconut Grove nightclub one night. She left him filing for divorce that year in 1955. I do wanna make a point to mention here that although I've seen numerous sources and paper mention the Coconut Grove as a place that the couples would frequent, I didn't find many reputable sources repeating this exact story. Regardless of how exactly it happened, the marriage did end. This upset Rita so deeply that she was sent to bed under sedatives by her doctor and told to rest. Worse yet, that same year, Columbia Studios sued Rita for refusing to appear in the film, Joseph and His Brethren. She had been traveling to Europe with her children, both to clear her head and possibly so that Ali could see his daughter, Yasmin. Ali originally offered Rita a million dollars to raise Yasmin in the Muslim faith with Muslim instructors and to bring her to Europe for two to three months each year. Rita refused, however, and stated that she wanted her daughter to be raised in America and in the Christian faith. Ali Khan died when Yasmin was young in 1960, but during this time was trying to juggle a career, her two children and custody battles. Needless to say, it wasn't really working. So by this point, Rita was so frustrated with Columbia and Harry Cohn that she refused to even show up for the proceedings. Columbia argued that Rita had agreed to appear in two films and she was contracted to do so, but Rita said otherwise. In fact, she sued them right back, demanding the return of a $100,000 bond posted to guarantee her fulfillment of her contract with Columbia. According to the New York Times article from April 9th, 1955, the complaint said Columbia had nullified the contract by its failure to begin principal photography by last March 8th on the first of two pictures. It was revealed yesterday that Miss Hayworth had notified Columbia she considered the contract ended because of delays in starting Joseph and his brethren, which was said to have been the first film. Although I wasn't able to find a definitive end to this suit and it seems they may have settled out of court, grainy newspapers from the 60s say that even a decade later, Rita would flinch at the sound of Cone's name. She claims she felt like she was owned by them and that though she wasn't scared of him, he was a monster. Supposedly low on funds after the legal paddles and her marriage with Hames, Rita sued Orson Welles for unpaid child support nine years after the original $50 a week judgment had been handed down for their daughter, Rebecca. This could have just been because she wanted him to pay child support too. I can't confirm what her finances were at this time. She was unsuccessful, but just a couple years later, she found herself in a fifth and final marriage with James Hill. Rita Hayworth met James Hill not long after divorcing Hames. He cast her in one of her last major films, Separate Tables. They married on February 2nd, 1958, and though Hill urged her to keep acting, Rita wanted to retire and paint. Hill pushing her to be in movies was the least of Rita's troubles though. One friend, Charlton Heston, described a meal with the newlyweds in Spain as the single most embarrassing night of my life. Apparently, Hill heaped obscene abuse on Rita until she was reduced to tears, her face buried in her hands. Heston also wrote in his autobiography that he was tempted to slug Hill, but he and his wife left the table instead. I'm ashamed of walking away from Miss Hayworth's humiliation. I never saw her again, he added. Both his mental cruelty and pressure led Rita to file divorce for a fifth and final time after only three years of marriage. Throughout the 60s, Rita faded from the spotlight. She told one reporter that she felt cast aside because Hollywood only wanted an image and not the depth and feeling that she could provide. At this time, Rita also began to display symptoms of early onset Alzheimer's. However, being relatively young, family and friends attributed her confusion and fading memory to severe alcoholism. Though Rita tried to debut on Broadway in 1962 with Step on a Crack, it was delayed for undisclosed health reasons. In 1970, John Hollowell interviewed Rita in the New York Times in an article that's questionable at best and shows just how many considered Rita just to be some faded alcoholic star rather than looking a bit closer. He wrote, Rita Hayworth is not Gilda anymore. Age has had at her. The body is heavier, the face is lined, it doesn't look lifted, and the celebrated red hair is now cut short. But you could never mistake her for anyone else, just by the walk alone, a walk that has been choreographed and copied a thousand times all legs, or by the way she tosses her head to imaginary movie cameras that never stop, wearing a black and white Greek native dress that billows so you have to guess just how much age has done to that body. Rita Hayworth sits me down in her sparse study at a square table and speculating what, what's under her dress in an article, it's just weird, but I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have made it past editors today. But aside from that, I did genuinely find Rita's humor and attitude a bit refreshing. 
Her mental state had gotten so bad that on the set of The Wrath of God in 1972, her ability to memorize lines just evaporated. One makeup artist said she taught Rita one line at a time, moving between the dressing room and set every sentence. Her children grown, a lonely Hayworth would let her dogs out in the middle of the night in Beverly Hills, hoping to talk to neighbors. Often neighbor Glenn Ford, her co-star in Gilda, would come out at night to keep a confused Hayworth company. She often became violent, once throwing a drink at dancer Adele Astaire's face in front of Adele's brother, Fred. Another night, she invited fellow movie star Ann Miller and a friend to dinner, only to chase them away with a butcher knife screaming, how dare you invade my private property? I don't see autograph seekers. The next day she called me, Miller told Leeming, and said, why didn't you come for dinner? Given that Rita was only in her 50s during the 1970s, her worsening mental state and drinking was thought by many to go hand in hand. In 1974, both of her brothers passed away within a week of each other, increasing her alcohol dependence. In early 1976, Rita had to be removed from a flight after having an angry outburst while traveling with her agent, leading to a lot of negative publicity after disheveled photos of her began appearing in the papers. According to her agent, they'd been sitting down when out of nowhere, Rita pushed all the dishes onto the floor, looking dazed, and one of the stewardesses tipped off the press. Clearly she was unwell, but people didn't know why. Finally, in 1980, Rita was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and in 1981, ordered by the Los Angeles Supreme Court to be placed in the care of her daughter, Yasmin. According to Baron Lenner, a historian and physician, thanks in large part to Hayworth and Ronald Reagan, who both went public with their diagnosis, federal funding in Alzheimer's research dramatically increased. From $146 million in 1990 to more than $650 million in 2006. Unbeknownst to her, Rita massively helped destigmatize Alzheimer's. It's upsetting that we all thought she was drinking and we attributed all of her behavior to her being an alcoholic, Hayworth's nephew, Richard Cansino, recalled after her death. I feel guilty I perceived it that way. Yasmin perceived it that way at first too. According to Yasmin, she'd taken her mother to doctors and rehabilitation centers later in life. Though Rita did have an alcoholic breakdown, she never seemed to get better, even when she stopped drinking. Though Alzheimer's doesn't cause or isn't caused by heavy drinking, it definitely exacerbated Rita's condition. Many people at the time believed that Alzheimer's simply caused forgetfulness, but the disease can also cause people to become irritated and aggressive, and Alzheimer's patients do experience extreme mood changes, especially when they feel fearful or confused. Rita may have had no intention of causing trouble on the plane. If you found yourself tens of thousands of feet in the air without any recollection of how you got there, you'd probably be easily agitated too. Rita Hayworth passed away in 1987, and while so much of her life has been tragic, I want to end this episode on somewhat of a happy note. A few years before she passed, Rita had been in Brazil for an appearance when she vanished, leaving her handlers frantic. All of a sudden, we got a call, her agent Bud Moss recalled to Leeming. About a mile up the road on the beach, there was a group of kids flying these beautiful kites, and there was Rita sitting there on the beach with these little kids flying kites with them. I think it's beautiful that at the end of her life, Rita was able to find comfort in her daughter, Yasmin, who continues to have annual Rita Hayworth galas in remembrance of her mother and to raise funds for the Alzheimer's Association. The first gala was held in 1985 and they've raised almost $20 million since that time. To her fans, Rita Hayworth was bold and beautiful, but to those who knew her, Rita was soft-spoken, graceful, and kind. So much more than Gilda, a woman purely invented for the screen. And that is going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you learned something new about this little look into Rita Hayworth's incredibly tragic, but incredibly interesting life. Make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to these episodes so that you can stay up to date on all of the recent ones. I appreciate you taking some time to spend it here with me today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.